Hey, welcome back to another episode of the Gig Harbor Flycast. And I'm Blake from the Gig Harbor Fly Shop. And today, my guest on the show is Nick English. And Nick has been a part of the fly fishing industry for a very long time, but he's new to us. And he is our Grundens rep. And we're going to talk about Grundens today and talk about some other really fun stuff. I'm really looking forward to you listening in on our, on our conversation. But I wanted to let you know real quick before we get started, a couple quick things. First, I want to make sure you know about our fly of the month club fly of the month ships you flies every single month to be used that month we also send an email that gives you all of the dirt on how to fish those flies where to fish those flies uh, and we we talk about techniques and presentation we talk about different spots that you need to go check out and hit to be successful it's really a way to to really build up your fly inventory that with flies that are successful for the entire season. Now there's a freshwater and saltwater uh, option for you, or you could do the combination. Many of you do both of them. So check that out on our website, Fly of the Month Club. The second thing I wanna let you know about is our Puget Sound Saltwater Clinic. Now this clinic is great. It is packed with information, over four hours of videos that will walk you through everything you need to know to be successful out on Puget Sound. But we also have a follow-up class once you've taken the online video portion, and that is an in-person class where we spend an entire day together working on casting and presentation, as well as going out on a couple different beaches to really put everything you've learned into practice. So check out our Puget Sound Saltwater Clinic on our website, or you can check the show notes or the links if you're watching here on YouTube. The last thing I wanna let you know about is our guide trips right now are really ramping up this spring and we have a lot of bookings. We're really excited that we've expanded our guide staff, but even with that, we are really busy. And so if you wanna book a trip in the next five or six weeks, I would recommend not waiting. We have a lot of spots already taken. There is still some opportunity. We also have some scheduled group trips coming up. So if you don't have a fishing partner and you would love to get out on the water with a guide, you can join in with a group and it's great to just be able to split the cost of a guide trip in that way. Well, I won't keep you any longer now. Let's jump into our conversation with Nick English. I'm here today with Nick English and he is our Grundens rep. And I wanted to sit down because there's some really cool, exciting stuff that is coming out with Grundens. And if you don't know who Grundens is, well, you will after this uh, episode here. But Nick, thanks for joining us today on the Gig Harbor Flycast. And uh, um, first, just want to talk a little bit about uh, your story and how you got into fly fishing. You've been in the fly fishing industry for a long time, but where did fly fishing start for you? It started at a super young age. So I think I was three when I caught my first fish on a fly rod. Both my parents fly fish, my brother fly fishes, uh, both my grandfather's fly fished. So it's kind of just been in the blood forever. Wow. And uh, three, were you like in the backpack, like doing that whole thing? Or like, like it was on a little creek in Yellowstone, actually. Um, <laughs> nice. Back, God, that was a lot of years ago. I'm 40, so that was that was a few years ago. So I've been fly fishing for a long time. But uh, my my family grew up, and we had a little tent trailer and a truck, and we towed it all around the West, and we went to fly fishing conclaves. We tied flies as families at those things. We helped with youth programs. Shoot, we drove to Alaska twice before I was 15 years old uh, from California, from Northern California, where Dang. I grew up. So, like, we would do it all. I spent yeah. my 10th, 11th, and 12th birthday on the McLeod River. Like, <laughs> it was what my family did. And I didn't play sports growing up. Like, if you give me a baseball and you're like, Nick, throw this baseball, like, to somebody with a bat, yeah. I don't think I could do it because yeah. I just never learned how to play sports growing up because oh. we were too busy fishing. That's in that's amazing. So, yeah. So this is, you know, we talk about uh, in the industry, right? We talk about like the river runs through it, oh, yeah. you know, boom of fly fishing. But you were, so you were in in on it before that yeah. even happened. And so like you're, you're OG like flying. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe not like as OG as some of these guys, yeah. like not quite a lefty cray or, but. Right, but, that's like super OG. Yeah. So uh, we're in Northern California because I'm from Northern California too. Oh, I didn't even realize that. Yeah, that's yeah. funny. So I grew up in a little town called Rescue. No way. Did we just have a real estate? I've never heard of it. Oh, okay. I was yeah. like, oh, man, are you it from that like area? It sounds like it's like super far north, though. It's not that far north. It's actually in the foothills outside of Sacramento. So do you know where Auburn is? Placerville? Yeah. So okay. my, my, I grew up in Granite Bay. So my dad helped found Did the Granite, <laughs> Granite Bay Flycasters. Are you serious? Yeah. Like, literally, that was my dad and, like, oh my gosh. five this or six other planned. people. This is all. This like, is. <laughs> this is. 
this is ridiculous. <laughs> this is really funny. I oh. I know so many people from Granny Bay Flycasters, and yeah, no, I how I, have we never crossed paths until I started working with you at the shop? Right, that's like wild. super recent. Like yeah, yeah, this is pretty cool. Huh. Oh, we, yeah, we get to go down memory lane together. Oh. This is so much fun. So, it's such a small world. Yeah, so like, yeah, my folks live super close to Folsom Lake. Yeah. And I, gr- I grew up fishing Folsom Lake and a lot of just gear fishing for like catfish yeah. and bass and stuff like that. But, oh, yeah. but fly fishing, there's all of these little farm ponds around Granite Bay. Everywhere. And like, so bluegill and bass, that's really like how I got into into fly fishing. And you know that area oh, yeah. like really well. So like, well, like, um, like the the Yuba, you probably fished a bunch, and my dad got the Yuba no bait back in the. It would have been the early '90s. So him and wow. a couple people from the club worked with Department of Fish and Game in California to get bait removed from the Yuba because it still had wild steelhead and it has the wild yeah. trout population yeah. in there. And so they got bait banned from, I think it was the section from like Highway 20 Bridge up to Inglebright. Wow. Yeah. That's so cool. like we fish that all the time. Feather American sack. Yeah. I, I mean all that stuff. Yeah. You know. Well, and here's yeah. the interesting thing about Northern California fly fishing is that if you don't live in Northern California, uh, I mean, what people assume like California is like, you know, they think of like Los Angeles or the Bay oh, yeah. Area or, you know, but they don't realize that that Northern California has some incredible fly fishing, incredible fly fishing. It really does. And, you know, it's California is an amazing state. The resources that are there are incredible. My mom's side of the family, farmers growing up, settled the Sutter Buttes. So like long history there. And they fished all that stuff. I mean, my uh, grandpa's mother built a cabin up by Truckee, actually in Soda Springs. And there's pictures in the cabin of Lahontan Strut cutthroat pure strain yeah. out of the Truckee river back before they had overfished them for commercial harvesting yeah, yeah, yeah. and there are legit 40 pound lahontan cutthroats laying on the ground with my grandpa as a kid <laughs> that they just like you know they were just food fishing right, right? it's just right. what they did back now then grocery shopping yeah <laughs> and it's like if there wasn't so many people and they didn't over the resource imagine what california could be i right. mean no different than a lot of the west yeah, coast yeah. but California, again, back to your point, has an amazing resource yeah. of angling opportunities. Well, I'm not going to hotspot things. It's kind of like we, <laughs> we don't like, I mean, I, I do this all the time, like with our uh, YouTube stuff or like social yeah. media, like, you know, I'll say like the Olympic Peninsula, but I'm not going to say yeah. like what river or anything like that. But anyways, there is a section, there's a, uh, an area in Northern California off of Highway 80. So if any of you are want to go do some a little adventure, uh, hiking <laughs> around and uh, go explore some stuff, I'm, I'm going to put you onto an area there's this area called the grouse ridge vehicle closure area and it's like you know where bowman lake is yeah, yeah. so it's like kind of uh southeast and and east of of bowman lake and kind of north of fuller lake and there's, there's yeah. a road bowman lake road and then everything to the east and it goes a considerable distance but i've caught like six different species of trout back in there and it's not a wilderness area it doesn't have like that like protection yeah. um, status, but but it might it should be, yeah. and it looks like it is, and it kind of flies under the radar, I think, with a lot of anglers because it isn't like you know a lot of times you look on a map and it's like you know whatever wilderness, and you're like I'm going there because it's it's the wilderness, yeah. You know? But this like vehicle closure area, it you don't know looking on a map if it's private property, if it's you know whatever, but it is so cool. Like it's just tons of just. Uh, uh, I mean, it's it feels like it's more rock than trees, just granite yeah. everywhere. And there's all of these cool little bowls that are all filled in. And there's so many different types of fish back in there. I love it. So for those of you watching, go check that out. Grouse Ridge <laughs> Vehicle Closure Area. Uh, it, there's, I mean, there must be like 50 lakes with trout in them. And uh, you can hike all around the place. And, and I love it. But man, crazy. That's such a small world. Small Our industry world. continues to be smaller and smaller all the time. Too. Right. It's so funny yeah. how that works. Yeah. So, okay. So th- when did you move out of California? Uh, 15 years ago, I moved to Bozeman, Montana. I okay. was uh, guiding in Alaska. Actually, at that point in time, I'd kind of had a career in the Bay Area, not necessarily in the fishing industry, but I'd worked at a fly shop off and on late high school and early like into my early twenties, uh, American river fly fishing. It's no longer there in Sacramento, but that one of the owners of that now owns Keeney's fly shop. So sure. still in existence in Sacramento area. That was my like, home you know shop those. growing yeah. up. That's so funny. That was it. I remember yeah. Gary and Al and Gary and Al, Peter, yeah. Peter was the other partner with, yeah. uh, Gary. And then Gary bought Peter out and Al was a fixture there forever. He lived on yeah. Folsom Lake and fished that all the time. Yeah. Great, yeah. great guys. Like I still, still see him every once in a while when I'm back home. <laughs> that's, that's my brother still lives there. So, yeah. no, that's... um, 
But yeah, That's I awesome. uh, I just kind of got burned out on California and uh, was like, I need a change. Left my job in the Bay Area, kind of like in that boom in the early 2000s when sure. the economy was going crazy there. And there was yeah. just jobs and I'd quit college for a job. And I was just like, what am I doing? And then I was like, this sucks. I was like, I don't like working 80 hours a week like and doing stuff I don't want to be doing, right? And right. so I went back to the shop actually. And I was like, hey guys, like, I don't really know what I'm doing now. I quit this job. I got like a big bonus that year. So I was just fishing and surfing the coast and not really doing anything. And they're like, you want to go guide in Alaska? Cause I'd done some guiding for them yeah. and taught fly fishing and stuff like for the shop. And, uh, I was like, yeah, that sounds great. So they hooked me up with Sweetwater travel. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, then next thing I know that summer I'm flying up to, um, the uh, Copper River Lodge on the Copper River out of Iliamna and Very just cool. started guiding in Alaska. Yeah. Chef there was um, also a chef at Bozeman Bistro. This little restaurant used to be on Main Street in Bozeman. Yeah. And he's like, man, you should move to Bozeman. You'd love it there. <laughs> so I didn't know what I was doing. Like my girlfriend and I had broken up because I was being selfish and went to Alaska, right? Like typical guide in Alaska story. I don't know right? what you're talking about. I don't know anyone else that's <laughs> done anything like that. <laughs> it is such the quintessential story of any fishing guide that goes to Alaska. Like you're not thinking about us. What are you doing? So I go up there and I'm like, oh, this is great. Love it. Moved to Bozeman, just sight unseen, just packed wow. up my stuff, just moved up. up there. Yeah. And I was like, never looked back. And, and yeah. at least you knew one person. Yeah. <laughs> I had some other friends there that I knew, obviously. Yeah. It's like this, you know, the fishing world's right. obviously pretty small. But right. yeah. So that was kind of the, I would call that like the kickoff to my fly fishing career in some yeah. ways, because then it kind of put me at that epicenter of trout fishing, right? Like right. a lot of people consider Bozeman. I, I have to say that I think there's other places that have amazing fishing. Sure. Bozeman has just been touted as that epicenter yeah. of fly fishing. Right. And we, you know, we probably have more fly shops per capita and some of our surrounding communities than most places do. Um, but yeah, it, it really kind of spurred an opportunity for me there to a go back to school and finish my degree and then b get in with Sims fishing products that I worked with for 12 years yeah. and in various stages of my career from repping to running business, uh, wholesale business for them and kind of to where I am today. So, um, moving to Bozeman was kind of one of the best decisions I made that was kind of spur of the moment and helped me just stay in the fly fishing industry. Yeah. Very yeah. cool, man. Yeah. So, and we had just recently, uh, met because, you know, yeah. especially with us and, uh, being really big with Patagonia and not yep. doing Sims. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that have been in the industry a long time that I just don't cross yeah. paths with just because of the, those different circles. And so it's been super cool to, I mean, even cooler now than knowing yeah. that you're from Northern California. That's so wild. It is pretty wild. Um, but, um, so Grundens, uh, for a lot of people in the fly fishing world, um, they're not really familiar with Grundens. Now I would say that a lot of people in the Northwest, and I would assume a lot of our customers, um, especially living on the peninsula, they probably do know of Grundens, have heard of Grundens, but, you know, so who is Grundens? Um, like, yeah. give us a little bit of their history in the world of fish, yeah. and um, and then we can we can chat about like kind of where they're where they're going and why that's actually relevant to anyone that's listening or watching. Yeah. So Grundens has been around a long time. So 1926 was when they were started. Carl Grundin was his name. The Swedish guy started this company to start making commercial fishing clothing essentially and, and then it was just it was rainwear really is what it was right like pvc bibs and slickers and technologies weren't quite as advanced back then but it was like they needed foul weather gear to keep them dry on boat decks all day long and so everything that kind of has come out of grunden's was all about keeping guys out on the water fishing it was just commercial fishing so evolution of the brand continued to evolve i won't go through the entire timeline but it was commercial 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 and then they got into sport fish a number of years ago because they saw that these same guys that were maybe commercial fishing in their past life went in started guiding you know you still see guys wearing these pvc bibs and pu stuff out on columbia on like buoy 10 oh, yeah. fishing offshore it's it's very coastal in nature that's kind of where it right, originated right. you see it on the east coast you see it on the west coast you even see it in florida louisiana i mean you go down there guys are wearing the bibs the deck boots all that kind of stuff so yep. all of a sudden sport fishermen start wearing it and they're like oh this is great we can make stuff a little bit more technical so then they got a gore-tex license and they started making gore-tex products and so that evolution has continued to evolve so it wasn't just commercial rainwear anymore it was like hey let's make stuff more technical for all anglers and their tagline is we are fishing right yeah. whether you're ordering a slab of sustainably caught sockeye salmon from alaska out of bristol bay that fisherman was probably wearing Grundens. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, in, yeah, in like 
all those people eating salmon at lodges, if the lodge didn't catch it, they probably got it from Bristol Bay from a commercial sport fisherman, right? Right, right. So whether we're fly fishing, we're conventional fishing or commercial fishing, it's kind of the root of who Grendon's is. So they're like, we can make stuff for all anglers, right? We're fishing. Let's service all fishermen, yeah. whether commercial, fly, or conventional. doesn't matter. Yeah. And so right now is the big uh, the big entrance into fly fishing, um, which, you know, some people think of fly fishing as being like this separate. Uh, some people think of it as a separate entity or, or sport or anything like that. And then other people think of, they just see fly fishing as just part of the it's big fishing. sport fishing thing yeah. right and even our industry has at, at times has had to try to have their own yeah. trade show that's been independent and then we've also had a trade show for a couple of years where it was just a part of the general tackle <laughs> iCast uh show mm-hmm. um and so so grenin's is now jumping into fly fit with some fly fishing stuff relevant for especially anglers that i would say uh, I mean, it's, it's definitely relevant to anglers that are all over the country, but I think, man, it's definitely coastal, yeah, right? Like, I mean, foul weather, coastal, uh, saltwater, uh, and rivers, um, you know. So, uh, kind of give us an overview of what they're what they have, yeah, not what they have coming out. What came out yesterday? Yeah, we, we got our big ship so, yesterday. Literally, We're so excited. yeah, it was it was awesome. So I just went into Gig Harbor Fly Shop yesterday and saw the first pair of the new Grundens. Uh, boundary stocking foot waders and zip waders on the shelf. They just received them yesterday, went into the shop maybe two and a half hours ago, and it was like, oh, this is awesome. There it's come are. to fruition, right? Because yeah. they, they started talking about it, and I think word kind of got out around IFTD last year. Yeah. You could kind of hear some buzz around the show, the Grundens folks, like Ben Crook, who's the VP of sales, Curtis Graves, who's kind of the mastermind behind Gore, and like a lot of that stuff, Dave Mellon. Dave Mellon wasn't there, but those guys were there walking the show, and then that's when the rumblings kind of started. So then that's when stuff started to come out. It obviously started to get sold in last uh, summer, really really in fall. Right. And then the, they just started shipping. So now they're in shops. And so this is kind of the foray. There's one waiting boot, uh, a couple of models of waiters, one for women. And then we'll see a continued line evolution in the future here from Grundon. So they'll continue to focus of making kind of fly angler specific. Sure. And again, whoever wants to wear it, there's no problem there. And I, I want to go on record by saying fishing is fishing at the yeah. end of the day. There is Almost every single one of us got our start throwing a bobber with a worm for bluegill or something of that nature, right? And I think we're doing ourselves a disservice if we lose touch with that, right? And what gets kids into the sport nowadays, right? I'm getting on a little soapbox here, but I feel really strongly about this because I grew up actually fly fishing. My parents didn't didn't spin fish at all. They taught us to fly fish from an early age. We didn't have spinning rods. But as soon as we were older, we started swapping with our buddies and be like, they wanted to fly fish. We wanted to spin fish. So my brother and I were spin fishing and these guys were using our fly rods and we were trying it all, right? And it was like, this is super fun. And so at the end of the day, if you're taking care of a resource, I don't care how you're fishing, right? Sure. Like all that matters is the resource. Be respectful, be responsible, follow regulations. Fish however makes you happy, right? Yeah. So just backing up from that now, back into the product. Yeah. They have great new waders made from Gore-Tex launching. Yeah. They just started shipping yesterday or shops just started to get them yesterday. You can find them in your favorite local fly shop. Um, Gig Harbor's got a full line of them right now. Full line. There's yeah. links in the description below. <laughs> so one of the things I love about the, the new boundary waiter is that they have one with a zip. Yep. And some people, you know, don't really see the importance of a zipper. They, they think it's just like um, convenience, but I can tell you for, uh, man, steelhead guiding uh, in the winter when it is just raining uh, hard, when you don't have a zip waiter and you, you have to actually take your rain jacket off to like go to the bathroom, it is, that is like, yeah. that, that you start reconsidering life decisions at that point, like. You're like, I should have got the zip waders. Yeah. I mean, they're easy to get in and out of for sure, but I don't, you know, for me, that's not that big of a deal. It's, but it's definitely that on the water convenience of being able to leave my rain jacket on. Oh, yeah. Um, and everybody says that. Like, as soon as you have a zippered waiter, you don't go back. <laughs> no. And I've been wearing zippered waiters for a long time. And yeah. once I got my first pair, I was yeah. like, yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't need I'm anything never, but this, right? right? And yeah, it adds a lot of convenience. Those zippers, it's a YKK Aqua Seal zipper. They're proven. They've been, they don't leak. I mean, that's yeah. that was everybody's concern when the first zippered waders came out. And once it was proven, it was like, no, this concept is proven. YKK put a lot into the development of it. 
why not? Yeah. Why not get a zippered wader yeah. and be comfortable on the water, especially if you're fishing in foul weather. Right. Again, going back, like Grennan's makes foul weather gear, and you know we're foul weather company. Like yeah. you're standing out there on the op, and it's snowing and, and we raining live in sideways. A foul weather yeah. location. <laughs> what oh are yeah. Some of the other standouts of the waders, as far as uh, just features, yeah. You know, maybe material or other just kind of yeah uh, aspects of the wader that you really like. Yeah. So there's a few unique things about it. So they use utilize a four layer Gore-Tex in the lower part of the wader, five la- or three layer in the upper. So it's going to be a bit more breathable, more durable in the lower half of it. Um, the stocking feet are unique to Grundon's waders. So they're you know most people are working with Japanese high quality. Ne- a neoprene for stocking foot because yeah. that's kind of been the gold standard for a lot of years um but grunnens has been working with this other company and it's a titanium alpha booty and it, marketing buzzwords like right these <laughs> companies like, come up that means. yeah so <laughs> all it means is they put these two layers of titanium in there and one essentially blocks out the cold and one keeps the heat in wow. bottom line is in testing so i think it was I might get this wrong. It was like University of Indiana or one of those Midwest schools has this foot testing tank, essentially. And so they tested this neoprene, this titanium alpha neoprene versus standard neoprene. And it was about 10 to 12% actually warmer. So practical application of measuring temperatures and all that kind of stuff. So beyond the marketing mumbo jumbo, like real world testing, that's what it came in at. So your feet are going to be warmer in these booties than a standard neoprene booty, which makes a difference. That would have been awesome last Friday. (laughs) Fishing the OP in snow. I was was on the OP and there was like four inches of snow and it's like (laughs) spring. I'm like, somebody (laughs) didn't get the, the memo that spring was on Monday. And it was, yeah, I know it wanted to. They wanted yeah. to hold on. I'm like, oh man. I still live in Bozeman and it got there was two feet of snow that fell and last Saturday. Yeah. I was like, ah, I'm glad I'm not shoveling that right, <laughs> right? now. Right. I missed right. a good skiing, but that's okay. I got plenty of skiing in this last winter. Yeah. Anyway, well, so, so tell me about the like pockets yeah. and gravel guards and, and so that as we kind of work stuff. up the waiter, uh independent gravel guard from the stocking foot, the whole idea behind that. It's like a really robust shoulder power stretch material that um, actually drains water too, so it won't hold water in your gravel guards. It can be replaced if you wear them out. So all the pieces and bits of this uh, of this waiter are fully serviceable for the life of the waiter. Um, going and up the waiter, no seams on the inside of the legs or the front side of the legs. So high nice. wear areas, they kind of tried to work really hard to get that. Again, Curtis had been, that guy had been working on waders and Gore-Tex for a long time. Yeah. He worked for ski companies. He's worked for other fish companies. And so he had a lot of background in the waiter development side of things or in the, well, it, his title is different than that, but working really closely with the people that designed the waders to make sure it was right in all these highway areas. Lots of testing. Going up the waiter, fleece line hand warmer pockets with drain holes on the outside that are shoulder power stretch. And then um, you have additional pockets too where you can actually hold other like small fly boxes, spools of Maxima, whatever you need in there. Uh, single pocket on the inside. You got that YKK zipper. And then you have this really neat uh suspension strap system so it's like a fused contoured suspension strap so it's a wider webbing and really soft and has a little stretch to it um a little bit different than what anybody else is using in the waiter market it just sits really comfortably on your shoulders and then there's an adjustment in the back so you know everybody makes shorts regulars and tall waiters right Right. so try to adjust for inseam is really what that's doing but this adjustment allows for torsion torso adjustment yeah. with this back panel it's kind of hard to describe over video you can look at it on the website yeah, there'll be pictures cool. of it and stuff huh. um like you guys will probably have at, well on the pdp pages like when you guys build out on your website you can yeah. see pictures of that uh, but you can adjust that height so that you get those suspenders really comfortable and the waiter sits right on you yeah. and you can even adjust it if you're wearing a big thick jacket in the winter time or if you're wearing them in the summer with just a solar shirt on right yeah. so you're Very able cool. to kind of make some tweaks to that waiter and make it kind of customize it yeah. a little more to and your then size. it ends up being a real four season waiter yeah you know because sometimes you like you know you get in your your waiters and like you're used to multiple layers and yeah. puff and all sorts of stuff and you're like oh man i'm I can't breathe. <laughs> I was talking with Jack earlier. Jack's one of the employees at Gig Harbor Fly Shop. I think he's probably been on some videos before. But um, so Jack was talking about this stream in Oregon that runs at about 40, low 40 degrees in the summer when the daytime temps are like 100 degrees. And, you know, that's the really cool thing about a Gore-Tex waiter, too, is you might start to get sweaty walking to a river. But if you know how Gore-Tex works, as soon as you get in that 
water, that vapor transfer comes out through there and helps to actually cool you off while actually drying you out on the inside of it. And that's the really yeah. cool thing about a Gore-Tex waiter. So, Very cool. um, yeah. So I was like, yeah, man, go ahead, take them out there, wear them this summer and see how they perform. Jump in the water after hiking around yeah. and, and you're going to notice a difference. Very cool. Yeah. Well, so we've had uh, a couple different customers come in and ask about uh, the Grennan's waiters and, um, and there's been a lot of anticipation for them, but, um, and, and it is the big deal for Grennan's for this year, but it's not the only thing that they have going on no. that is relevant for, uh, for fly anglers. And so, I mean, what are some of the other standouts that yeah. you just really, I mean, I remember personal you, favorites, yeah, yeah, personal favorites. Oh yeah. So yeah. I I've got a couple of them. One is footwear. So the deviation boot ankle boot is phenomenal. So take off your waders, you pull that thing on, it's got a lug sole. It's amazing for slipping into in muddy, snowy, slushy, wet environments, like yeah. perfect for the Pacific Northwest. I wore them all winter in Montana. I get done skiing. I throw those things on for, you know, driving back to town or whatever, going to the supermarket. They're phenomenal. So like the deck footwear is amazing. In that same vein of footwear in the summertime, they're flip-flops. They use Sea Deck. If you don't know what Sea Deck is, it's a phenomenal foam product that's used on boat decks kind of all across the country. I think you guys have some kayaks. I think Hobie right. uses yeah. it on some of their kayaks. Yep. And it's a non-slip foam surface. And so Grundens entered a partnership with Sea Deck so that all of the flip-flops have a Sea Deck footbed on them. So they have a really nice footbed. You're comfortable. And then when you're in and around the water, your feet aren't slipping off of it. And then they all it, That's super durable stuff, too. Oh, yeah. like it's yeah. it doesn't stink either like you know how flip-flops start to stink after Not like <laughs> but I, I could imagine yeah. other people's you've probably, probably smelled of buddies that had stinky <laughs> feet i used to work with a buddy i'm not even gonna say his name but he knows if he ever listens to this i'm thinking of him oh and he gosh. knows he had the stinkiest flip-flops ever ever uh we used to throw him away when we'd find him if he'd leave, leave him laying around that's someplace. just natural just, mosquito repellent yeah. right there oh, like. so bad <laughs> but the c deck actually does a good job of not stinking i, I think because it just dries out or doesn't absorb the water i don't yeah. know that there's probably some science right. behind it that I, that's over my head but sure. i just know they're phenomenal and then some of the other products i really love um there's a jacket called the gambler jacket they initially made it for the bass angler and we discovered it's just a phenomenal jacket for the steelhead boat rowing fly casting angler it's got this stretch in the back that's gore-tex it's called gore-tex topo stretch um only fishing brand that's using this so your range of motion in your shoulders is just phenomenal so whether you're rowing a boat spay casting single hand casting it's just so comfortable to wear all day uh, and all their outerwear all their uh, their high-end outerwear all has this neoprene cuff seals the water yeah. out really nicely so Everything, again, it kind of comes back to foul weather environments or right. water environments and how does this create functionality for the angler and whether you're a commercial angler, sport fish angler, or fly angler. The neoprene cuff. Um, I mean, and the thing I love about that jacket is that there's an over, like an over sleeve yep. that goes, what would you call it? Over cuff? Yeah, I it goes over, over the cuff. nylon. It's kind of like a shingle cuff design yeah, is what so, it is. But the thing Secondary I love Gore-Tex. about it is that, um, you know, if you're out on the coast and you're rowing a boat and um you know you you have rain hitting your hands you know many of you probably have had this experience where that water starts to creep in and then it gets like your your base layer is wet and then it starts to just keep soaking up your sleeves and then you can't you can't get warm like your 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 hands your arms just get freezing cold and they never warm back up because they're because they're wet and that neoprene cuff yeah uh, not only is it is it uh you know keeps that water out but it's really comfortable too because oh it's amazing um, yeah no i i love it that's my easy to get part. on and off too right it like is. even i've got a big running watch on that you can see here and i can slide that thing over my watch and yeah. there's no issue and yeah. it still seals right there so it, it is really nice and they make some great base layers great flannel shirts there's one called the kodiak shirt that's like i live in that thing in montana in the winter it's an insulated flannel it's just phenomenal to wear all winter and then their their base layers have a funny name called grundies yeah so i just think that's kind of funny because they're all just underweighter wear yeah. right or under bib wear under jacket wear and they, they got a good name but they're they're solid product too i yeah. mean really everything in their line the more i wear it i'm just like oh this is a really cool piece for this and and there's there's a lot of cross application there even even some of their other base layers there's one that you could even put knee pads in because it was make, made for working folks and it actually fits underweighters great uh is it has a tapered leg for fitting under bibs and into deck boots it's a really burly soft shell material. It's called the bulkhead. And you wear that thing and like you take your waders off and you're wearing it. You can wear it into, you know, 
the bar wherever you're going into you could pop the knee pads out if you, you don't wear your waiters in. into the bar no i don't wear a beacon into the bar too when i'm done backcountry skiing but that's uh that's for people that are cooler than me yeah, yeah. <laughs> um well so what what's coming up from grunden's that you're, that you can share about that you're excited yeah. about. Um, so that same deviation deck boot, yeah. there's an insulated one coming this fall. It's like Sherpa fleece oh, lined. Oh, come on. That is going to be like the ultimate steel headers boot right there. Like you take off your waders, you put that thing on and your feet have been cold all day yeah, or whatever. You, and they're just so nice and cozy. Oh, man, you're they're going to be my, You're speaking my language. Yeah. <laughs> Especially all those people that have, you know, rain odds or poor circulation. Like they're going to be real cozy. Um, you know, there's a, a few new colors like flannels and stuff coming this fall, but really that new deck boot this fall. Next spring, we got a lot more to look forward to. So cool. we got a couple more models of waders, a couple more models of wading boots. Uh, we might even have some wading jackets coming down the pike that are a little more fly centric so sure. you know shorter you know we've talked about it before like higher pockets like yeah, yeah. really for that more traditional fly angler so cool. we'll continue to see development coming along that and and focusing on hey how do we serve every anglers are there pieces missing out of our line listening to feedback from fly shops from guides from product testers from just any, anybody who's out there angling it's like hey we love this but it needs to be like this for our application and, and trying cool. to really make some cool stuff for anglers pretty exciting yeah well, what about for you do you have any fishing plans this summer or any <laughs> any trips that you have coming up or are you just like with this launch like you just on the road non-stop i mean i gotta imagine you're yeah. gonna have a couple fishing stops along the way but anything you're looking forward to yeah i mean i always find some time to fish obviously um i uh, i also do this thing with my wife every year and usually some friends end up joining it's a really obscure event that we've been doing for i want to say about eight years now in Montana, we check off a new mountain range every summer, and it's a small window where you can do this. And you're going to be like, what? It's called corn and cutties. So we ski corn snow, and we catch cutthroat out of a lake below it. Yeah. And we literally just pick a new mountain range every year. I find out which lake it's going to be. We look at snow packs. You, get, you really have to like look for north-facing stuff that holds snow late enough sure. because you got to have – the lake has to ice off. And there has to be enough snow to ski at least a thousand vert. So those are the two qualifications. It has to be cutthroat <laughs> and it has to be at least a thousand feet of corn skiing. So how many years have you been doing this? It's eight now. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That's so we've hilarious. been checking off all these mountain ranges in Montana. And last year was the first year I actually caught a fish while still on my skis. So we skied all the way down. We skied like this 2000 vert line, skied this couloir off the top of this peak and the pioneers all the way down to this lake and caught a fish wearing my skis. And I was like, that was to me, you know, it was a small cutthroat. It was like eight inches yeah. long or whatever, but yeah. it didn't matter. Yeah, right. It was this awesome. just like bizarre thing that really wouldn't matter to anybody. You could get one of but, those like ruler stickers on yeah. your skis just for like <laughs> holding the fish up to it. That would be kind of hilarious actually. <laughs> try something like that. Yeah. But we've got a few other ones in the works. I got a buddy that lives in Portland that we're going to try to do um, corn and chrome this spring. So we're going to try ah. to either swing a king or a, or early summer run steelhead um, and ski like Mount Hood corn. So we're going to, we're going to make some variations of okay. it. Um, he's done corn and carp before. And <laughs> really? uh, yeah, so they skied Mount Hood and then caught carp out of Columbia. Oh and uh, yeah, just like, you know, fishing is amazing, right? I love fishing more than anything, but we all have other passions, sure. right? Like you got a stack of guitars over here. You're so right. I know you love to play music. Yeah. And so think about if we can combine a couple of our passions and right. that's where like, I love to backcountry ski. I love to trail run. And I love to fly fish. Like those are the things I love to do. Very so cool. I combine them all the time, yeah. fish high mountain lakes all the time. And so I just try to make like those fishing plans are also part of other plans. Yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'd love to go to the Seychelles tomorrow, but you know, <laughs> it's yeah, not, you not both. yeah, it's not always yeah. happening for right, us. Right? right. So yeah. And all, I just love fishing around the territory too. Like, um, you know, getting some steelhead fishing in, I'm looking forward to that this fall and we'll see where i end up exactly but uh yeah just cool. getting out no major plans at this point but right well hey it was great to have a little conversation about grunden stuff and yeah. to get to know you a little bit better and um if you want to check out some of the new grunden stuff for spring 23 we have links in the show notes or if you're watching on youtube in the description below check that stuff out and we will see you in the next episode thanks I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Nick. And before you go, I just want to remind you to make sure to check out our schedule for guide trips that are coming up. We have some incredible saltwater guided trip opportunities for sea run cutthroat trout and the calendar is filling up and I want to make sure you get in with one of those dates. So check the website, check the links uh, with the show and hopefully we'll be with you out on the water soon.